So my name is Jack Townsend, and as I say, tonight I'd like to ask, can opening up knowledge save the planet? Okay, so that's, that's my hashtag, I mean that's my, uh, my Twitter handle. I am a researcher at the University of Southampton, uh, in, uh, in the, in, down in um, the South Coast, and as I say, I'm a co-organizer with Team Web here in the UK, and I've also been doing a lot of work with the Open Knowledge Foundation. And uh, specifically, I've been working on uh, organizing the sustainability stream of the Open Knowledge Festival, the OK Festival, that took place in Helsinki in, um, in Finland in September last year. And that, for me, was a fantastic opportunity, and perhaps a world first opportunity, to really take stock of what opening up knowledge can mean for sustainability. Um, and uh, again, a lot of the people who organized it with us uh, are here tonight, um, James and uh, Chris, you've also met, also Velichka and Hannes. Uh, it's good to see you, you here. Hi, Hannes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so, yes, it was a fantastic opportunity to take stock of what opening knowledge, may, opening up knowledge, means for sustainability. And and, and at the end, I had the honour of being able to to be the, um, one of the two people with Chris who who summed up the um, the, the week. And uh, what I'm going to give you tonight is hopefully a a, a bit of a, a jazzed up version of the same talk. So when we talk about open knowledge, um, you know, first of all, we're talking about open data, and and you know, it, it's core to open knowledge. And here we are in the Open Data Institute, and uh, but there's a lot more to open knowledge than just open data. As we as we saw at the, the conference, there are um, this open access to the scientific literature. We had the, the tragic uh, passing of Aaron Schwartz uh, a, couple, a week or two ago, um, who was working on opening up the scientific literature. Uh, there's the whole creative commons of content that is shared online between people, um, including uh, you know crowdsourced stuff, um, wikis like Wikipedia. Uh, there's open source software. There's um, personal data, and I'll talk a bit more about that later, which, uh, in a sense, is, is another uh, version, uh, type of open up knowledge. And there's linking to the data together, and, and it goes on. There's open hardware. There's a, so there's a lot. There's a lot to opening up knowledge. And so the question we're asking tonight, another way of rephrasing it, is. Can the creative commons save the natural commons? We've got a, people talk about the, the tragedy of the commons. Uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is, the problems that we face in sustainability are often um, termed as, as tragedies of the commons, that uh, the atmospheres, the atmosphere, the oceans, the fresh water, they're resources that no, we don't look after um, because they're held in common. And so the question is, how can the, um, the fact that we're producing these, these common resources of knowledge, how can they help us look after these, these natural commons better? Stop uh, trashing the place, basically. Well, so what I'd like to say, what I'd like to put forward tonight is that there are three key ways in which uh, I see that uh, the opening up knowledge can really help with sustainability. So the first one is efficiency, making things more efficient. So the question, how many planets would it take if everyone lived like a European on this planet as three. it stands? It's been more than three. Five. Five, three. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking to a, a, a knowledgeable crowd. crowd. The answer is three. Five is good because that's, that's the answer for America. If we all lived like, <laughs> like Americans, um, then we'd need five. And this is with the world as it is, as it stands right now. Um, in Helsinki, we, we learned that we can expect 10 billion people by the end of the century living on this planet. And, and that's not because we're having too many kids anymore. Um, uh, this guy was, was keen to point that out. Birth rates have come down dramatically. The problem is just because there are so many young people on the planet, demographically, we're going to end up with 10 billion people. Who is this guy, by the way? Who knows? Hans Rosling. Hans Rosling, yeah. A great, amazing chap. Um, amazing person in the world of open data and, and, and visualizations. And he gave this fantastic demonstration using only the power of toilet rolls uh, to convince us of the case for, for um, having 10 billion people on the planet. So yeah, do check out that talk, it's online, as is all the content from the Open Knowledge Festival, um, so please you know, do, do go and check it out. Okay, so, so I guess talking about efficiency in the broadest sense, how do we get more out for, for, for putting less in? How do we get more human benefit, what we really want out of this sort of global economy? for less environmental, putting less environmental resources. 
in at the other end. And I guess the first place to start is thinking about efficient processes. How do we make the sort of processes um, that we undertake much more efficient? And so the question is, what can opening knowledge, what can opening up knowledge do to help with making processes more efficient? And actually, just sharing information, just the simple act of sharing information, better can make things more efficient. So a great example of that are these three apps that I use all the time um, in London, in Southampton, when I want to use the public transport, um, uh, the underground, when I want to use the, um, the buses, I use these, these three apps. And they're open data apps, they're because the, the uh, you know, Transport for London or the, the Southampton Bus Company is, is, is sharing <coughs> feeds of data about, about their services. And that makes it a lot more efficient, but makes it a lot more easy to use those services. It makes them more competitive with driving or, or other means of transport. So, sim so simply sharing information can actually make things more efficient. But it goes on because once you've shared data, once you're sharing data amongst each other, then you can start to think about optimization. You can start to apply the, the, the massive computing power that we now have at our disposal, um, artificial intelligence, algorithms, um, using all this data to start to make things much more optimal, much more uh, efficient in, a, in an intelligent way. And a great example of here is one of the winners of the Green Hackathon that we had about a year ago here in London, um, which was Masters on C. Is, uh, those guys in here? Yeah. They're the just it's literally working. Literally around the corner, working away, two optimizing, <laughs> as we speak, optimizing uh, massive amounts of, uh, of open data. Um, and, and, and one of their projects is around, and the one that won the, the, um, uh, the Green Hackathon is around, if you've got Hadoop processes, you can move them around uh, the planet to wherever is cheapest, but also more and most environmentally friendly. Um, so this is a great, it's a great example. And those, are, those guys are actually incubies um, of the Open, uh, Open Data Institute, and hence they're based in this very office. So generally, efficient processes rock. Great stuff. But as any, um, any dolphin will tell you, um, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We need to be a little bit cautious. So when we, uh, this, as everyone knows, in the modern world, massive amounts of data are being um, harvested uh, around us. You know, the fact that we have so many sensors, the fact that we use things like social networking sites, um, massive uh, exponentially growing quantities of data are being gathered about where we are, about what we intend to do, about what we want to buy, about what our finances are. Um, and with all that data, there is the potential, with all this computing power, with all that data, we can make things an awful lot more efficient around, um, around people. And, uh, and, and you know what we want to do and what we are doing, but of course the question is, is always the thing. The question with a lot of web science stuff is, what does that mean for privacy? So that begs the question: Can we process lots of personal data about people to make things much more efficient, much more optimal, and can we still have um, privacy? Perhaps, actually, perhaps, and. Um, and this is where uh, a, a program of the, the UK government called My Data is really interesting. And that's around personal data and about um, giving you access and control to the data about you. And actually, before the ODI even opened officially, um, they had, um, we had here the My Data Hackathon um, that took place in its offices um, in sort of the autumn. And uh, MyDex were uh, a personal data company, a my data company that, that uh, supported that, um, that event. And the idea with MyDex is that you, in the MyDex model, you have a personal store of all your information about, you know, it could be, you know, your finance information, your, your, um, your, your social network information, but it's all in one place and you have control of it. And so you have, um, you can, you don't have to worry about the privacy because it's yours. So, um, <coughs> So a great example there is the Empower Me app that, um, and what that does is it provides instant, personalized, energy-saving advice. Hmm. The idea is if, <clears throat> once you've got all the data in one place, you can build apps, you can build visualizations on top of that, and you can, you can ask that, uh, those, uh, that this, in this case, this app empower me to tell you, okay, given the sort of person you are, given the things that you own, the things that you can do, these are the sorts of measures that are most economic, that are best for the environment for you to take. 
um, in order to you know make your your house more efficient, for instance, more more energy efficient. So, so that's the idea behind behind empowerment. Um, so this was uh, so successful that uh, Chris and uh, Jason, my fellow coordinators of um, of uh, Clean Web, were invited to to number ten uh, to talk about it with the, the policy ones there. And I've actually managed to find a picture on the internet of the. Uh, the historic moment. They're waiting to the crowds of personal data enthusiasts. Now that's the moment, that was the Twitter handle. So, so personal data, um, so, it's, so that's one great thing you can do with personal data, but also personal data can give you really valuable feedback. And that can give you real control over your resources and how you're using re resources, because a lot of the time we don't really know how we're using resources. So a great example of this is the green bit green button program um, that happens in the, the, that's come out in the States and the idea there is that it's an industry developed open voluntary standard for presenting energy usage information. And what it means is you can go to a website, you can press a button from your, like on your utility, com your utility company's website, you can press a button and you can download your energy usage profile and that way hopefully you can learn about what you're doing and you can start to um, be more efficient and save energy. So this is great, but, always a but, again, when we try to push things in one direction, when we head headlong in one direction, when we try to reduce the use of some resource through some sort of efficiency improvement, what we often find we get is rebound. And what rebound means is process efficiencies might not actually end up reducing the resource efficiency itself, as we might have hoped. Um, so let's just think of an example here, where, where might you spend the money that you saved on heating? Go on holidays. Go on holidays, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You might want to go here, for instance. <laughs> so, um, paradoxically, saving energy can end up wasting energy in, in um, airline fuel or, or whatever other sorts of energy you, you talk about. So this is an example of, of, re uh, of rebound effects. And, and generally, we're talking here about unintended consequences. The world is a really complex social technological system and when we try and change it we don't necessarily get the consequences that we, we, we expect. At the most extreme we've got Jevons paradox which Francine from, uh, um, from, from uh, Mastodon C talked about at, uh, at, at one of the, the recent clean web meetings and uh, Jev Jevons paradox means that actually when you make something more efficient, when you make a particular process more efficient such as a um, classic example is the steam engine during the Industrial Revolution. You can actually end up consuming a hell of a lot more coal because it becomes a lot more, a lot cheaper to use that project. Um, so we have to watch out for these rebound effects and these unintended consequences. I guess the other side of thinking about uh, efficiency is asking, well, what is it that we really want out? If we want to make things more efficient, so what is it that we're being efficient in order to achieve what? And um, perhaps, again, dolphins can teach us a thing or two about what makes really efficient happiness. How do you have a minimal impact on your natural environment for being as happy as you can possibly be, like these three guys? Um, you know, the Americans actually did it as well with the whole idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the classic sustainable development um, perspective talks about three pillars, that there is this economic pillar that we, hear, that we tend to focus on, but there are also social pillars that we should be, we should be trying to achieve goals around, um, about health, around education, and the environmental pillars around not mm, you know, trashing the place, not messing up our environment so that we uh, damage the prospects of uh, future generations. Um, but with all this, we tend to fixate in most narratives around progress. We tend to fixate on the economic one around GDP. <coughs> GDP is a, is, a, is a pure measure of, of, um, of progress. And here again, we, ha we had a, a chance to explore these issues at, in Helsinki at the Open Knowledge Festival, where we had a, a session around how we measure progress in a more sophisticated way. And that was, that was a fascinating uh, meeting, and, and we had a number of different people come along. One was uh, someone from Findicator, which is the Finnish government website where they publish all sorts of statistics that you can find out all about life in Finland and work out whether it's a great place to live, independent of just how rich it is. 
Um, so anyone who's really, really interested in Finland, then I recommend to go out and check. Find all manner of statistics. Um, there's another another great example is Yotopia. So this was a, a project done by um, Velitska and, uh, and Guo and a few other people from the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, a year and a bit ago. And what that does is it, it takes open data from uh, the World Bank and which compares different countries and it allows you to say, okay, you answer a few questions and by answering these questions you can find out which country suits your preferences for what you find important. In a, in, a, in a country, what, 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 you know, what, what's progress for you as an individual and which countries see you? So that's, a, that's a really interesting novel perspective and shows how open knowledge can really help with this question of how do we go beyond GDP to start to define some other more sophisticated um, understanding of, of where we're trying to go to. Okay, so that all was talking um, about efficiency in a very broad sense. So now I'd like to go on to the the, the second major way, the second key way in which I see open uh, knowledge can really help with sustainability, and that is engagement. So firstly, um, a, a moment to reflect. I think opening up data is just the start. You can't just say that opening up data is going to make the world a better place. And certainly for engagement, to engage with people, it takes a lot more. So when I'm talking about engagement, I'm talking about uh, the uh, data as a um, open knowledge as a social medium, as a media, as, a, as something that's used in politics and in people's opinions. Um, and the thing is with human beings we don't really react to, to, to cold figures, even cold hard facts um, really don't have much of an effect on us, on us a lot of the time. We re relate to things like imagery, to stories, to narratives, we engage with things that matter to us as individuals, our personal um, frames, as they're called, um, and what, what matters to us. So knowing that this was a project that we um, set up, that we created at the beginning of last year called Globetown. And the idea there is <coughs> to look at um, So if you're interested in uh, using open knowledge and open data for, for um, public engagement, then I really um, suggest you check out the, the entries there competitions because there's some, a lot of fantastic examples. Um, and so the key point here is that open knowledge can be vital for informing people's opinions about how sustainability works. Um, opening up knowledge is about transparency. I mean, the two things are almost uh, synonyms. And transparency is often often uh, seen as something that can tackle corruption. Uh, and so, an example here uh, again, guys came out to Helsinki from Ron. They they're the land matrix, and what they're doing is trying to create a, a, they're creating a, a crowdsourcing portal where you can crowdsource uh, information about um, different land deals, ma major land deals around the world, from one part of the world to another. Um, and obviously, this is something that's happening at, uh, much, much, much more with with all sorts of uh, factors over the last 10 years, economic and social. So the idea here is that by crowdsourcing this data, by creating this, this, this open knowledge, shared commons of information about this, that um, local governments and civil society in those countries will be able to hold uh, the, the companies, the governments that are buying this land accountable for the social and environmental implications of what they're doing and um, any, any corruption that's involved. So, um, accountability is a major theme here. In a similar, in a similar sense, uh, we had uh, James Cameron come out to Helsinki, who uh, is responsible for the Carbon Disclosure Project, which has got, uh, I think, all the major companies in the S&P 500 in America, all the major companies in, in, the, in the FTSE 100 in the UK, um, to release information on their carbon, uh, their carbon emissions. And again, once that data information is there, then they are much more accountable for that figure, for what they are producing, with direct implications, hopefully, for uh, the climate. As he says, um, on behalf of 385 investors with assets of $57 trillion, which is just a mind-boggling number, I think that's actually pretty much the entire world economy. So, so yeah, open knowledge can, can be big shakes. 
All right. Okay. So that's the second one. So that was uh, engagement. Engagement with the challenges of sustainability uh, in for people and for governments and for institutions. So the third way, the third key way I see in which open knowledge can really help with sustainability is innovation, becoming much more innovative. Because to be sustainable is to do things differently, because we're not doing a lot of things very sustainably at the moment. So we have to work out how to do things differently, and to do things differently is <coughs> innovation and working out new ways of doing things. I guess intuitively, it's kind of obvious. If you share knowledge more, if, if knowledge is more widely available, then uh, innovation should be promoted. I mean, that to me seems intuitively obvious. Jorge um, Zapico, who was one of the other organizers of the um, Helsinki Sustainability Stream, uh, talked a lot about the hacker ethic, which is really fascinating, around how the open knowledge community owes its sort of ancestry to uh, the culture that has emerged around the internet and hacking in the States in the 70s and 80s, and how that has a, an ethic behind it and how sustainability is a normative value and we should be talking not just about technical fixes and how technically uh, these things, uh, opening up knowledge helps with sustainability, but also the, our values and how, how our values impact them. And, and there are a lot of values implicit in the open knowledge uh, community and the hacker ethic is, is behind it perhaps. And a key part of that is creativity. Um, creating these, these sharing, sharing information amongst each other so that you can create the open source software or, or whatever else. And he talks about the, uh, the hacker ethic replacing the mundane old Protestant work ethic that we used to have. <laughs> um, and, um, or the, the, the maker ethic, as it's called. Uh, so being okay with... And, um, and, and I mean, this is great. And I mean, I think what's great about what we do with open knowledge, what we do with web technologies, is that we're not afraid to fail. We're, we're not afraid to do lots of stuff and have most of it fail. And that's how you really innovate. Um, we're not um, the sort of producing the long tail of things that don't really go anywhere. It's how we produce the things that do. And the best way to predict the future um, is to invent it. It's a quote from Kay. And a great example of all this was the Green Hackathon that I mentioned already that took, part in, uh, took place in London and we have different events around America, around the world. Um, thanks to, to Laura for this picture. And uh, this was another uh, guys who came out to Helsinki. They are they were they're doing a fantastic thing around using ho open hardware to innovate appropriate sort of technology. So if you go to solarfire or you, you can download <coughs> the designs for free for this solar oven, and wherever you are, you can use basic. Uh, you just need some mirrors and a few sort of metal or even bamboo to create this this solar oven, and then you have free, uh, very green energy to roast. Uh, your crop of um, to, you know, to cook or to roast your crop of, um, of coffee or whatever um, indefinitely for free. So, and because it's open, uh, it's got that open source ethic, ethic, people can then innovate, they can take it forward, they can redesign it, they can republish um, what they do with it. So it's really exciting stuff. And um, there's also a project that I, I, I'm, I've been working with um, maybe I've been working with who's doing the open research project. So um, to work with the, the, the photovoltaic industry, which is centered very much in the Pearl River Delta in southern China, but also in Taiwan. Um, and uh, they are perhaps, they're doing an awful lot to produce a lot of uh, photovoltaic very cheaply at the moment, but they need to do a lot more to drive innovation. And she's working with them to open up their information resources to work with each other and to work more with the world to, to um, develop new photovoltaics that we require for the future. So that's it. So, in conclusion, will opening up knowledge save the planet? That was the question I wanted to ask. And the answer is, well, actually, not necessarily. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that we need to worry about in order to make it work. Um, and I just mentioned a few, and I could, and I could go on, but um, privacy is something we always need to think about when we're thinking about opening, and sh opening up data and sharing data in the world of the world. Um, in, any sort of, in any sort of change that we're trying to make to a really complex social technical system, we're going to have unintended consequences and the rebound effect, and Jevons paradox are examples of that, so we really need to look out for those. And opening up the information is just the start. There's a hell of a lot more that we need to do to make it really engage, if we're talking about engagement, to make it engage with people's values, what really matters to them, dry facts, dry data, just 
just don't cut it. So with all these reasons, and with more, this is why I've been really excited, really happy to launch the Open Sustainability Working Group within the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, in the last uh, couple of months. And the idea there is to create a community and to create a place for an ongoing, ongoing dialogue around opening up information for sustainability and how we make the most of these resources, these, these uh, open knowledge resources that are being created um, as a potential, as a, as a basis for sustainability. And this is uh, open for anyone. You can just join, if you just Google Open Knowledge Foundation, Open Sustainability, um, you can find there and it's, so please, if you are interested in this area, please do come and, come and register and, and become part of the conversation. So, yeah, please come along. Okay, so I'm going to rephrase that question. Now, last time I asked, will, but actually, can opening up knowledge save the planet? And to quote a certain James Smith, the answer is, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> hell yes, it can. If we use it right, if we, if we, if we make the most of it. Um, it's an excellent foundation for sustainability. Um, and as I've said, I see that um, primarily about being efficient, about being engaged, and about being innovative. So that's it. Thank you very much. I've already said thank you very much for the Open Data Institute for having um, host us. Thank you for everyone who organized the sustainability stream in Helsinki, especially to Belichka, who is the, the central sort of organizing mind. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and, and making it out tonight to, to come and see us. So thank you. Cheers. While uh, we're setting up for the next speaker, does anyone have any questions for the Jango talk? Okay, we've got one from Bowie. I'm just going to take three. Uh, so, uh, so Bowie, yeah. go, please do just go ahead, actually. Yeah. Um, Jack, so in engagement happens to be the element that really worries me more than any of the other ones. Yeah, yeah. And I'd be interested to know if, you know, like any initiatives that are happening already that, that's likely to make progress on that, anything you know about? Um, in the, yeah, well, I mean, I think that there's, there's a, a lot of work going on. I mean, yeah, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's um, yes, well, I mean, as I say, I think the, the most interesting thing that I've come across these various competitions, in terms of like using open knowledge for it, um, obviously hackathons, um, but also competitions like the World Bank one, where we had, um, I think there were 14 finalists that came out to, um, to, uh, to uh, uh, um, Washington for the, for the actual final ceremony, ironically enough, for climate change. Thing. And the, I think the winner was from Argentina, and his his idea was uh, just to allow you to. Uh, it was really, actually really quite a simple site, but it, it just allowed you to say, given where I live and, and given sort of small changes that I would make to my lifestyle, what would the impact actually be in terms of you know numbers of tons of carbon saved each year? So so just really quite a simple thing for saying, uh, if I do this differently. How, will, how much better will that be? And I think the guy who came second, we came, we came third, the guy who came second was um, uh, working on, uh, his thing was uh, well, kind of similar but for a country really, he was from Norway, and his, and his was looking at sort of pathways for the, whole, um, for the whole of Norway, how that would change going forward, and, and allowing you to change the variables and see what Norway would look like under different energy scenarios. And on a similar note, there's a fantastic piece of work by the 2020-50 calculator by, um, what's his name, by uh, David McCart Mackay, the, the, uh, the guy uh, who works in the, the uh, uh, deck. <laughs> and, and that allows you for the UK to look in great detail and constantly to make lots and lots and lots of detailed decisions about how you might design the energy. Uh, landscape going forward because it's it's not easy and there's a lot of compromises that need to be made. So, um, so I think those are some some great examples. But I think there's an awful lot more work to do uh, to to reach beyond just the people who are interested. Yeah, that's yeah, the big that's challenge, isn't it? Because we're engaged, so we wouldn't be here, right? Well, absolutely. Yeah. For the rest of the world, for yeah, you to engage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I, I guess journalism is another huge part of that. I mean, so much journalism relies on this information as a as a foundation. Okay, do we have any further questions? Oh, we've got one more. I've got one more question. <coughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, 
James, yes? Okay. Um, I have a comment. Um, I'd say there'd be another fourth pillar or challenge. Mm -hmm. And back to your comments at the start of Arnold Schwartz, Schwartz is um, kind of combating the status quo and the politics involved with that. Yeah, I mean, I've got to throw that in with engagement. Um, as, as in, yeah, engagement, but I mean, yeah, it, it, it's somewhat arbitrary, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about that as how you engage individuals, but also how you engage governments and institutions, or, so campaigning, and uh, and even sort of how governments sort of work with each other, which is a major stumbling block, and uh, yeah. Okay, I saw one hand, so do we really quick question, so uh, to make sure that we... Uh, can stay on time actually. Um, is it Tom? Yes. Tom yeah. I know because you're speaking later on. I am. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, years ago, I used to work for an organisation that did a lot of stuff around engagement. But, but one of the interesting things was all the data that we used was often proprietary. So you have organisations like the Stockholm Environment Institute have fantastic tools mm -hmm. that do very very sophisticated analysis of how you can describe. Um, we had a conversation in the back at the time about you know, <coughs> making open data because it's frustrating that. We're limited in what we can do because every time we have to come to you guys to do some analysis, we'll also come back with it. Mm -hmm. um, was there much discussion of that at this event? Uh, the, uh, the, the OK Festival? Right? About, about the, the, the fact that, in, in a sense, this, a lot of your talk is about, it's not about open data at all, it's generally about engaging people. How do you use information and sustainability? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And part of that is whether it's open or not. Yes. Yeah. Most of the data out there isn't open, well, but it's being used by companies, charities, the government, and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess the whole thing, in a sense, was was about how do we um, how do we open out. And, I, and I'm, I hope with this community, it gives us a place to actually, with the open um, sustainability group, it, hopefully, it's a place where we'll um, have a centre for really pushing actively um, against uh, people who are holding back key pieces of data that will be key pieces of, of knowledge that need to be out there. In the, in the shared domain in order to advance sustainability. Um, yes. I mean, Vodichka, do you think we we covered that specifically? I mean, I think uh, what you, you said about innovation, I mean, open data is actually the key in, in, in research. You know, if you share data in an open way, you enable um, innovation. So I, I think it relates to what you said. We didn't talk specifically about uh, Open data was more more of a general concept.